Irish Scotland. Um, we're just a small but really ambitious food policy and food justice um, charity based in Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, but we have, um, I suppose, ambitions for change across the world about how food systems work. And we see climate change is really integral to food um, and COP being hosted in Glasgow next year is an amazing opportunity for Scotland and the UK to really step up um, how food is being regulated and looked at and talked about across our communities. So just before we start getting into the nitty gritty of that, we're going to be using um, platforms in two ways to try and get make sure there's quite a lot of um, feedback from you guys and also we can take on some of your comments. So please use the, the Zoom chat box um, to applaud the people who are giving the presentations. They've all put a lot of work into it, ask questions, make comments. But we're also going to be using another platform called Menti. So if you could open another window on your browser or perhaps use your smartphone and type in www.menti.com, that's M E N T I. And it'll then ask you for a code. So if you could use the code 90173314. And Sophie's typing that into the chat box at the moment. So that's 90173314 on menti.com. And hopefully, if this works, you will see a question. And if you could answer that question, that'd be great. So actually, just to say, one of the things about these virtual workshops is there is a massive chance they're going to go wrong, but we're just going to laugh through it. Okay. Right, thank you for the first answer. So what is your favorite vegetable? We've got an aubergine, a potato, a beetroot, kale and mushrooms. Okay, so for anyone new who's joining, we just opened menti.com um, and answering the question and the um, instructions for it are in the chat box. Great, well, there seems to be um, a huge, um, oh, a great variety of veg and that's something that Nourish loves to see is variety. <laughs> okay and just to remind anyone who joined after um, I said if you'd like to indicate what breakout room you want to go into towards the end of the session it's one for food policy, two for um, climate science and food, and three for COP and food. Um, and if you just change your name by pressing the three dots in the right hand corner of your screen um, and add one, two or three, and it's also in the chat box. Right, okay, so we've got a great um, a range of vegetables there. Um, I think we've got everyone, um, so there is a second question now. I'm hoping this is going to work. Can you see the second question? Yeah, great. So where in the world are you? If you could put in and um, write it down. If you are somewhere else entirely, please add in the chat box on Zoom where that is, because that would be fabulous to find out where you're coming from. Um, and actually, uh, equally, if you're somewhere else in the UK other than Scotland and somewhere else in Europe, please let us know. Great. Okay. Well, we've, it's central Scotland heavy. So um, I suppose that's where a lot of um, political decisions are made. So it's a, it's a good place to be heavy <laughs> in central Scotland. And a few in the East Coast. I hope the sun is shining there. It's not here in um, Highland Perthshire today. Right. Okay. 
Brilliant. Well, I think that's been a, a little bit of a warm up. It's time to get going. So let's introduce the first um, presenter today. We are going to first hear from um, Pete Ritchie. Uh, Pete is Executive Director of Nourish Scotland, um, which he co-founded in 2013. He also runs Whitmere Organics with his wife and business partner, Heather Anderson, and is a trustee of the Food Ethics Council. Pete is also, he's a first generation farmer and was previously founder and director of the Scottish Human Services. His favorite vegetable is celeriac. So without further ado, Pete, if you want to take over, that would be great. Great, thanks Keisha. Um, and can I just check that people can see this screen okay? Um, yeah, everybody see that okay? Yeah. Good. Okay, what a beautiful picture you've got here. Um, I should just say, here's the title, Food and Climate Change, Why It's Complicated. And um, you'll hear from Dave very later on about the, the complications in the science. I'm really going to talk about complications in the policy. So the first thing is, this is Nourish's latest effort to try to describe the food system um, for some work we were doing um, somewhere else. And the first thing you see is there's lots of different bits to it. But the most important thing in this, obviously, is the environment goes around the outside. And for years, we've been talking about food and agriculture in some ways as if the rest of the world doesn't exist, as if we can do what we want with food and farming um, and the environment will just cope with it. And what we've realised in the last 20 years or so is that the environment isn't coping and can't cope with the impacts of our food system. Um, Dieter Helm said it to Parliament the other day, you know, we can't carry on as if um, the environment doesn't matter, as if natural capital doesn't matter. So that's the big thing to understand, is that there's only one uh, planet that we know about we can live on and, and we're on it. So when um, we mess it up, we've got nowhere to go. Um, but within that, you've got lots and lots of circles. We've drawn four here, but at the bottom you can see the interplay between culture and diets, you know, and Diet is much more than a list of ingredients. It's about how we eat, where we eat, when we eat, who we eat with, um, the meaning of our food to us, and, and that's closely integrated with our, our cultures, both our cultures of, of cooking and doing things with food, but also our cultures of making food. And part of the, the challenge of change around the world is that we're hugely invested um, in our food production cultures. We, we have maybe nostalgia ideas about what farmers actually do or what fisher people actually do, um, but we think it's really important to support them. Um, sometimes I think if we knew a bit more about what us farmers actually do, the public might be a bit less excited about supporting us. But there we are, it's part of, our, part of how we understand our culture as a, as a country in Scotland, um, is, is what our farmers and fishers do. But also things like gardening allotments are an important part of our culture too. So the dancing culture at the bottom, up here the food, the food economy, we haven't begun to talk about all the different things that are in the food economy, but it's huge and it is everything from people who develop apps that tell you how many calories you've got in your tea sandwich to, to people who um, do the analysis of the bugs inside a cow's rumen, which is uh, probably more important. Um, but all sorts of things make up the food economy and um, it is the largest bit of the global economy in terms of its impact on climate and environment. And then there's the governance of the food system. And that's what I'm going to be talking more about um, from now on. So first thing to say is that um, food cuts across government, as you can see here, climate change, health, agriculture, the oceans, trade, social security, all have an impact on what happens in terms of people's day-to-day -day experience of food, whether they can afford it, what it's like, how it's grown, um, where it comes from, um, are all, and what it does for their health. It impacts all those different bits of government. Um, but to be honest, most of the time, it's not terribly important. You know, if you look at the budget for, for even for food and drink in Scottish government, even for agriculture, compared to health or education, it's very small. Um, it, it's, a, it's been certainly in the last 70 years, certainly up to the 2008 price spike, a question of food policy, we'll leave it to Tesco and we'll trust that the market will do a good enough job and we don't need to worry about it. There have been odd things with foot and mouth and BSE and and then the no deal Brexit and now the internal market paper where suddenly, you know, we care about food policy for a few days or a few weeks. But we've got to remember that overall in government spending terms, in government priorities, 
most of the time is not very important. And that's why the food system is undergoverned both nationally and globally. Um, it doesn't, it's, it touches everything, but it's not seen as anybody's overall job. So we'll come back to that. So, and that's the case, even though if you, if you look across Scotland, at least one in eight jobs in Scotland is in food in one form or another, at least it would be if we weren't all on furlough and having to wait for getting through this virus. But in normal times, it's at least one in eight jobs. And as you probably know, both globally and in Scotland, food accounts for 20 to 30% of our greenhouse gas emissions. And in a sense, Dave will probably give us much more detail on that. But whichever way you add it up, that's a big chunk. And it's absolutely clear we can't do the Paris Agreement, we can't do net zero without tackling um, food and farming. It's important to say how much agriculture shapes the planet. You know, it's a profound impact on the planet. In Scotland, 75% of land is shaped by agriculture. And that's and what we do, whether that's putting livestock on the ground, you know, nearly all the biomass on the earth is now farmed livestock rather than wild, life, wild animals. Um, cultivation, we've spent, you know, thousands of years and particularly more intensely in the last 70 years, cutting down forests and plowing up ground to grow crops. Um, and we use a wide variety of nature bending chemicals of which the most important probably is nitrogen, um, which um, Dave can tell us more about. But, but these chemicals all have massive and long lasting impacts on the environment. Our pesticides have, you know, distorted the um, ecosystem across the world in terms of particularly the damage to the insect populations. Um, and the way that we've, we've bred animals has sort of narrowed the genetic pool uh, to a huge extent too. So, and we also drain huge amounts of land, including peatland, which was storing a lot of carbon. Um, we are the fattest nation in Western Europe. Um, I'll show you this. It's quite a, a sobering picture when you look at, we're not where the United States is, um, but we are um, overwhelmingly tubby compared to our European neighbors, let alone our uh, colleagues in Korea and Japan. Um, yeah, I say, uh, not enough time to say more about the Korean and Japanese food policy, but, but some very interesting stuff there. Um, and we also have staggering levels of dietary inequality, which are entrenched and visible, both in terms of people not having any food and having to go to food banks, but also the, the difference in terms of things like fruit and vegetable consumption, which is directly correlated to incomes. So the, the things which are best for you to eat, it's very hard to eat if you're on a low income, whether you're on a low income or high income in, in Scotland and the UK, we eat the same amount of things which we're not supposed to eat so much of, as in fat and sugar, and we eat too little fiber in general. But what's different is that if you're on a higher income, you eat more good food in terms of particularly fruit and vegetables, but also things like carcass meat and um, cheese, I think you eat more of, but certainly you eat more of the protective foods, which is why people do better if they're better off. And then obviously we know that globally it's got a third of the food grown is wasted and it's easy to say, but it's, it's still a staggering um, figure. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is why the food system isn't doing what we need it to do. And it's not because it's full of bad people. It's because the way we set it up um, is really based on 18th century model of the world. And we haven't really updated our, our sort of program since then. First thing is that there's a feed the world narrative. I'm gonna just divert a little bit for two or three minutes and these slides will be available so you don't have to worry if you can't see all the details. Um, into, if you like, the fundamental premise of the feed the world narrative, which is that we have to do everything to maximize food production because there's gonna be a growing population and everybody's gonna eat more meat. It's really important, I think, to debunk that and for people to get around their, their heads around the fact that there is not a shortage of food in the world and the most likely cause of food shortage in the world is a, a nuclear exchange in South Asia. Obviously climate change is gonna have a, a drip, drip negative impact on that, but actually at the moment and for the foreseeable future, barring these sort of catastrophes, um, there's plenty of food in the world. In fact, too much, which is part of the problem. Um, but the graphs, when you look at them initially, you think this is really scary. This is the amount of arable land per person in, in, in the world. And interestingly in that, the developed countries, the richer countries, have more land per person on average than, than the poorer countries. Scotland, incidentally, because we're mostly hills and lochs and rocks, 
um, only has 1,200, that's 0 0.12 hectares of arable land per person, although we do have a lot of grass. So we're down here at the bottom of the graph here in Scotland um, because of the nature of our geography. Um, but if you look at Malthus' projection that, you know, obviously the population would increase geometrically and production would increase arithmetically, he was just plain wrong. If you look at the last hundred years, we've seen a massive increase. This isn't the amount of food, this is the amount of calories per person. And that's obviously, um, you know, well, well above um, what we actually need to, to live well on, you know, which is 2000 calories for a woman, 2500 for a man approximately. Um, and part of the way that we spend those extra calories um, is feeding them to animals. So if you look at this map, the purpley stuff is where we feed most of the calories we produce to animals. And um, the green stuff is where we feed most of the food we produce to people, uh, which is why countries with very dense populations and very low levels of agricultural land per person um, quite often are, are able to be self-sufficient in food while we're not, even though we have great climate, great technology, and all of those other things. At least we're not in the UK. Scotland's a different matter. Um, and if you look globally at what we grow on 2,000 meters, which is uh, roughly speaking the amount of arable land per person we have in the world, if you average it out, this is the way the world chooses to use its land. Um, so a lot of wheat, maize, rice. Unfortunately, obviously, a lot of wheat and maize is um, fed to animals, whereas most of the rice is fed to people. Um, and then you've got soybeans, again, mostly fed to animals. A lot of the oil seeds are fed to animals. But a chunk of stuff that's around food that goes direct to people. Um, when you look at that same 2,000 meter squared bit of the world that we all are, it's, if you like, it's our, our chunk of arable land in the world. This isn't all land, but arable land in the world. When you look at what we grow in Scotland on that, uh, it's barley. Um, so, and that obviously, unless people are really, really into barley bannocks, we're not eating that stuff. That's going to cows and to make whiskey and beer. Um, another chunk for wheat, again, mostly going to, not to make Scottish bread, unfortunately, some goes to animals, some regrettably still goes to biofuels, etc. And then rapeseed oil, again, we eat a little bit of rapeseed oil, you know, when we fry it up, but most of that, most of the rapeseed actually ends up in animal feed too. And then we've got a big chunk here, we, we use more land for stock feeding for, for animals than we do for fruit and vegetables, that's our tiny bit of, and that, that's a percentage of our arable land, which as I said is only a small amount of our total land. So that's what we actually do with our land, and that's why if you like the the feed the world narrative is, is a bit um, overrated. And if you look at the sort of headroom we've got in the world for growing more food, if we need to grow more food, um, there's still plenty of land out there that we're not using. Um, as I said, we, we waste a huge amount of food. We have major wheat yield gaps. We could produce a lot more wheat even on the land we do use. Um, and we could stop growing crops for biofuel. We use more land in the UK for biofuels than we do for fruit and veg. And obviously if we get less meat, we would need less cereals. So just that's so, some of the sort of um, reasons why the feed the world narrative isn't the sensible way of thinking about the world, but it still drives a lot of our thinking. And if you, if you scratch a politician, they'll often say, we have to feed the world. So whatever we do, we need to get farmers to produce more. And the drivers that are operating are produce and sell more, you know, for, for a farmer who's got high capital costs, high debt, you know, the only way forward often feels like produce and sell more. Um, reduce costs, take labour out, um, cut corners if you can, Every, everybody's on that mantra and we're talking uh, yesterday to one of the big multiple retailers who's saying in response to the coming recession they're on an all-out drive to reduce prices and the impact of that from a biggest, one of the biggest retailers in the UK goes back up the chain to farmers. If, if they're going to reduce prices, farmers have to reduce costs. And then this notion about adding value which essentially means processing or ultra-processing stuff to, to get more for the basic ingredients. So at the most simple level, don't eat potatoes, eat crisps, because the price of crisps is at least 100 times the price of potatoes that go into them. But unfortunately, because we use 18th century company accounting practices, the externalities, the damage we do to our health, to the environment, to the planet, to animals, doesn't appear on the balance sheet and it doesn't appear on the profit and loss account. So there's no way that the current system can reflect the damage we're doing or change the business model. So we're, we're, we've got a business model for food systems which isn't fit for purpose. 
if you look at the alternative purpose, which nourish would support, which is essentially the food system should be seeking to nourish everyone while healing the planet, that is entirely technically feasible, but it's obviously culturally challenging because it does mean us changing what we eat. It means changing how we farm. It means changing our food practices. It means changing major areas of government policy and patterns of land ownership and decision-making about land, et cetera, et cetera. So it's culturally challenging. But it's important to see that private system actors, for the most part, are not aligned with this goal. So it's not people's business mission to nourish everyone while feeding the planet. It's not, you know, even countries like Unilever, which are doing a lot of rhetorical statement, if you look at how their bonuses for managers, how their dividends to shareholders, how they are aligned, they're not aligned with this core purpose that we need the food industry to move towards. There's massive inertia in the system, and I said it's huge system, so any big system's got huge inertia. And then obviously industry will lobby for business as usual because business as usual suits bits of industry very well. Um, and it's much easier than change. So what that means for the food system is that as with climate change, global governance is essential. You, we won't be able to manage this food system transition without global governance um, as well as national action. But the role of non-state actors is also critical. So citizens, NGOs, cities, universities, trade unions, um, all local government, all these other bits of the system are also critical to the food system change as they are with climate change. Finally, I think this is my last slide, just to talk about the situation in Scotland in terms of food policy coherence. As I said, if we don't have a joined up food policy, it's very hard to achieve the sort of food system transition we need. Currently our climate change plan is weak on food and agriculture. We hope the next one's gonna be stronger. And I think unfortunately farming and nature are still seen by some people as a zero sum game. You can have more of one or more of the other, but you can't have more of both. And that's a really bad way of thinking. It really gets in the way of making progress. Um, but the current farm subsidy system has zero rationale. It isn't, doesn't have any policy objectives and it doesn't achieve anything except um, propping up businesses which need to change um, and inflating the price of land and making it harder for new entrants to get in. We have a bit of complacency, I think, on our environmental standards and our animal welfare record in Scotland, which is easy to say we're the best in the world, but if you look around you, um, in lots of key areas, we're not doing so great. And we have an overwhelming focus on exports, particularly of whiskey and salmon. Um, government's been making more effort recently in the last few years on food insecurity, but food isn't central in any way to the National Health Service, our biggest spending budget. Um, it's not seen as a core part of what we do in the health service, um, nourish people and there's no guidance from government on sustainable diets. Um, interestingly, Denmark brought out some stuff recently on eating less and better meat, but we're, we're still agnostic on any of those issues. And then we, although a local, a local food strategy has been promised and also a cross-cutting food plan, um, the Good Food Nation bill that Nourish and others supported has been dropped and there's no immediate promise of that coming back. On the positive side, we're seeing a lot more engagement from cities and local authorities. And Sophie will talk more about that when she talks about the Nourish project. Thanks very much. Great, Pete. Thank you very much. That was um, really thorough and it just shows the complexities of the issues that we're, we're dealing with and why we wanted to start um, talking to a much wider audience and making them aware of, of all of these things. So um, if you enjoyed Pete's chat, uh, please will you put some bits in the chat box and maybe use your applause hands. Um, it's doing speaks, uh, speaking on these types of things can be really difficult um, and it's always good to have a bit of motivation and feedback coming back. So if we go back to um, Menti, just before we go to our next speaker, so it's www.menti.com, M-E-N-T-I, um, and the code in case for anyone hasn't got it, it's the same as what it was before, that's 9017314, and it's also in the chat box. Um, and the, there's a new question. So what have you learned today about food systems thinking? Um, and if you can, pop that in that would be great and we'll be able to all see um, what your thoughts were about um, Pete's conversation. Okay while you're just um, doing that also to remind you that if you'd like to join 
Pete's breakout room um, at the end of the webinar or towards the end of the webinar to just either change your name to the number one for Pete or two for Dave Ray or three for to join Sophie on COP. Um, and if you aren't able to figure that out, just put it in the chat um, and Kat uh, and Tammy will be able to sort, sort you out. Again, there are instructions within the chat um, if you didn't catch what I was saying. <clears throat> so some of the responses, um, vital, there's not enough education when teaching people to cook food, so much waste and redivert land use. I think food waste is a is key, key element. Um, Yes, need to debunk the feed the world narrative. And there needs to be a fundamental rethink of how we value food production and nutrition. And just how little is invested in food policy, despite its far reaching um, impacts. Keep popping them in because um, everyone can see these um, responses. So it's, it's a great way to create um, a bit of a virtual conversation. Um, while you're doing that, I'll just introduce our next speaker, and I'm really pleased that Professor Dave Ray had the time to be able to join us today. Um, Dave is uh, Executive Director at the Edinburgh Centre for Carbon Innovation, Professor of Carbon Management at the University of Edinburgh, and Director of Policy at Climate Exchange. I have no idea how he finds enough time to breathe, let alone come and be on our webinar today, so thank you. Dave has authored over 100 articles on climate change, including five books, called, one of which is called Climate Smart Food. And I'll be putting um, a link to that book in the chat box later. It's actually a, a, available free online or you can order it um, as a hardback. He is also an advisor for the Scottish Government on rural policy and climate change. And one of his latest projects involves managing his farm on the west coast of Scotland to sequester a lifetime's carbon emissions. He is also a great um, part of the panel that I um, help coordinate called Farming for 1.5 Degrees, where we're looking at how Scottish agriculture can contribute to the Paris um, commitments. So um, without further ado, Dave, if you are ready, um, do you want to take over? Yes. Thank you, Keisha. And, and thank you for having me along today. It, it's a bit of a challenge because of the Pete did brilliantly in terms of covering so much ground in a short time. And when I drafted out what I wanted to say, it was more like um, a couple of hours rather than 15 minutes. So I'm going to try and keep it relatively brief and really have a look at some of the things Pete's already picked up on in terms of the scientific basis of food and climate change. Um, and particularly from that systems perspective, from a science point of view, it's one of the one of the issues we've had in terms of research and, and science across all areas, including food and climate change, is we often forget about the system and we work on a particular geeky bit um, and don't put that in, into the, the system context. And that can lead to unintended consequences. It can lead to uh, poor policy. So um, it's vital in terms of our food system that uh, that doesn't happen. And we do look at the system. So I'm going to try uh, and share my screen if I can find the right one. Uh, let's see if that works. That seems to be the wrong one. Hang on a minute. <laughs> Got too many open. Right. Yeah. Right. That looks like more more like it. Hopefully, you can see some. Um, slides there. Great. And, and yeah, Keisha's putting her thumbs up. So I thought I would just kind of cover, I guess, like it says, food in a climate emergency. Um, and the way I, I guess, often articulate it is, um, is food is crucial in terms of it being a cause of climate change. Uh, Pete's already mentioned the emissions that, are, that arise from uh, global agriculture, and I'll go into some of those data in a little bit more depth. It's also a huge casualty though. So one of the things we're facing is um, obviously more climate change. Climate change is already happening, but the impacts are going to intensify uh, during the 21st century. How much by depends on what we do, uh, particularly over the like, next 18 months. Um, but that's gonna affect our ability to produce food, uh, how well it, um, it kind of survives between farm and, and fork uh, in terms of spoilage. Um, it's a real threat to um, farming around the world in terms of climate change. 
Um, so obviously there's that, that kind of um, integration between cores uh, and, and casualty. But food and farming is also a real comrade. Uh, so we've got this net zero target in Scotland at 2045. Um, and when we look at agriculture and land use, it's impossible for us to meet that unless agriculture and land use um, work alongside the other sectors align with net zero. Uh, we cannot do it without our, our food production being um, on, on the ball in terms of tackling climate change. And it can be a, a huge comrade in terms of giving us resilience to future climate change impacts, but uh, crucially also cutting emissions. So on the cause side of it, so one of the resources I'd flag up if you haven't seen it before is our world in data so i saw pete used uh, some of the uh, graphics from them so um one of our colleagues hannah ritchie is is their kind of lead on food and climate she's she's brilliant if you go to their site maybe not now but you can see at the bottom uh, left there our world in data.org they cover loads and loads of topics so they're particularly focused on covid at the moment really really good kind of uh, evidence-based um graphics there but on food uh, really good information too and what this graphic shows is how important food is for global emissions. So 26% uh, is the estimate in terms of how much of all of the uh, human induced emissions each year come from food. So it's a major sector. Like I say, if we're tackling net zero in Scotland or globally, um, we have to make sure we get it right with food. And the great thing Hannah's done based on um, uh, research from uh, Poor and Nemechek is break that down into where the emissions arise. And you can see uh, again, this alludes to what Pete was talking about on a Scottish basis. It's the same globally that a lot of the emissions occur either for, directly from livestock production uh, and fish farms is, is included in, in there, uh, but also in terms of the, the crops which produce for animal feed. So we've got 6% of those uh, emissions. And at the bottom, one of the aspects, I guess, of food and climate change impact which we maybe isn't over, as overt in Scotland and the UK is the land use change which comes with it so you can see a huge proportion of emissions so 24 percent of that food related emissions is through land use change uh, particularly for livestock so uh, we see obviously deforestation and land use change uh, in in South America being a good example uh, there for beef production where you get a lot of emissions from the um, from the soil and from the loss of the, the forest that are being replacing. So if we, if we look at the system there, we've got some supply chain emissions right at the top, the blue stuff, and they're important. Uh, we hear a lot about that transport side in terms of food miles, but actually the key in terms of uh, the really big players is the uh, production side in terms of uh, where we can cut emissions. And if we're gonna, gonna tackle the, the sector, it needs to be right across the system. So it needs to make all those linkages rather than, like I say, going down into the little uh, silos. So uh, in terms of casualty, um, so I mentioned how vulnerable a lot of our farming systems are to climate change. Flooding and erosion is, is a, um, a, a real risk, obviously in terms of um, some areas in Scotland and, and, and across Europe already. Um, droughts obviously a major global issue as climate change intensifies we'll see more flooding and we'll see more drought uh, that's you know, inevitable based on um, warming our atmosphere one of the ones which is becoming more and more of a risk is heat stress so this is uh, for livestock and to crops uh, so those kind of peak temperatures that we're seeing um, can mean uh, yields drop radically uh, livestock uh, their reproductive success and their, their productivity drops so we're, that, that hit damages us in terms of emissions because if we're losing crops, we're losing livestock, we're losing productivity, then that means um, you know, the, the kind of the inputs increase to produce the same amount of productivity um, and uh, so the emissions also increase. The other kind of indirect effect, which is really important for a lot of our key commodities is pests and diseases. They react to a changing climate as well a lot of them, uh, we see an increase in, um, in, in risk in terms of damage to, um, to harvest, to productivity again. Um, and so, again, that hits us in terms of the, the overall emissions from the sector if we want to produce the same amount of food. And the final odd one, you might see, I guess, if you do a Google of climate change and food, uh, you might see some stuff which talks about, oh, it's great because we've got more carbon dioxide. And so that makes up for it all because we can grow. Uh, more crops and so you know climate change is a, is a good thing 
And what that completely forgets about is all of the things I've mentioned in terms of the impacts of climate change on productivity. But it also forgets about quality, that if we, um, if we look at uh, increased CO2 and just say, oh, that means our crops will grow faster, that's ignoring the fact it can have an impact on quality, it can have an impact on their um, vulnerability to pests and diseases, for instance. So basically, the kind of climate change in the 21st century, which we're looking at, is really bad news for farming, as well as uh, all the other sectors. Right, so on the Comrade stuff, the positive stuff, like I said, uh, agriculture and land use, you know, we, we can't deliver net zero, uh, the kind of emission cuts we need by the middle of the century to avoid uh, over two degrees of uh, warming without um, agriculture and land use being, being core to that. And I guess how, how it's delivered is a combination of things. It's cut emis cutting emissions on farm, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the measures uh, for that but it's also boosting sequestration um, on and off farm. So it's looking at whether uh, um, on a farm scale, whether we can increase the amount of carbon which is held in the soils, how much we can sequester through things like uh, tree planting um, and uh, uh, also looking beyond the farm. So looking at the landscape scale because all farming is part of the landscape and, and part of land use. How can that be integrated so we maximize the carbon uptake um, and, uh, and minimise the emissions. So essentially it's trying to be more productive uh, and more resilient um, and uh, as part of that I guess the, the direct measures, so like I say there's lots we can do, I would flag up the it can put you to sleep but the net zero technical report from the Committee on Climate Change particularly around the, the land use report they did uh, has some great um, information just in terms of the, the many things we can do to cut emissions. So Pete mentioned nitrogen, that's an area where um, our use of nitrogen fertilisers is pretty inefficient. Only about 50% of the nitrogen we apply um, in Scottish agriculture actually ends up in the, in the crops where we want it, in the food we eat. Um, so any increase in that nitrogen use efficiency gives us a cost saving um, as, a, as a farmer. Uh, but it also reduces the environment, environmental impact, not just of greenhouse gases, so nitrous oxide is a key one that arises from that, but also in terms of um, the air quality impacts, the water quality impacts, the biodiversity impacts. So nitrogen is, is core to a lot of those, those kind of cutting emissions on farm, but actually making the, making the farm system part of what we want to do for the Scotland system and the world system in terms of addressing the, the climate change challenge, but the biodiversity emergency, air, water quality, all of these, these, um, these pressures that we've got on our land. So there's lots we can do directly. I wanted to flag up um, some that kind of, in my geeky systems thinking um, mindset, um, also apply. So water and soil management, we might often think about irrigation, like the, the, the slide on the, the picture on the top left there. But actually, um, one of the key things there is also thinking about the water in terms of how it's exchanged with uh, the atmosphere and thinking about mulches in this case. Uh, they're combining the two using precision water management, um, using good data and good agronomy um, and, and thinking about actually how they can be more resilient in a, a future climate. Um, integrated pest control is a another really good example. Um, so all of uh, the bananas we eat come from the Dominican Republic and what they've really pioneered is um, the, the use of natural predators for their pests um, and natural disease control. They've managed to call the market really on organic bananas so they get a price premium but they found the system it, it gives them much more resilience um, in terms of pest control. Agroforestry is another really good example where we've got to see more of that in the Scottish context for net zero and farming and globally where we're using trees combined with either crops or livestock to give us that, um, that better system resilience, you know, whether it's giving uh, shade and protection, whether it's um, focused on the, um, the, the carbon uptake of the trees, but also the increased success of your livestock or crops. It's, it's done in many sectors already, coffee being a good example, um, and tea as well, uh, but it's certainly something which could be applied more here in Scotland. One of the aspects, I guess, to all of this is data, and so climate projections are really important, I think, in terms of understanding 
what the future is likely to hold. And again, we're really blessed in Scotland in having some um, pretty high resolution projections of what the climate risks are that can certainly go into the kind of top level policy of, of looking at is our food system resilient, but land use more widely resilient. So we're not just blinkered into saying, right, this will give us a carbon reduction. Um, but if that carbon reduction is only for 10 years and then a big drought or a fire um, means all the carbon ends up back in the atmosphere, then that's no good. That's not good enough. It needs to be linked up with resilience and adaptation uh, when, when we're making these kind of um, these decisions. The major one I wanted to focus on, and this was inevitable because it's been mentioned a few times, um, is reduced waste. And that's such a big one for the system because as we saw in one of the earlier slides, a lot of the emissions come on farm, whether it's livestock or uh, arable production. But if we think about our food system, we think about uh, global food um, uh, production and supply, around a quarter up to a third of that food is wasted somewhere in the supply chain. In the developing world, a lot of it is uh, actually in the field or in the supply chain before it gets to consumers. For us, most of that wastage is at the consumer phase, at the household phase. And so by reducing that, the ripple effect back to the production requirements on farm um, is, is, is huge in terms of the potential to reduce emissions. So I'm going to focus a little bit on that. This is where I was going to end up end up uh, talking for hours because I had loads of slides about what everyone had for breakfast and um, and, and their waste uh, stats but I'm not going to go into that detail on here. This is just um, a summary slide of what I was going to talk about which is really making that point that um, this is the, the global um, stats in terms of how much uh, uh, food is wasted uh, and uh, how much um, it's responsible for in terms of emissions. So you can see uh, this is because it's global, it's dominated by lost in supply chains with consumer waste also being important, but consumer waste dominates in terms of Scotland and the UK. But if you look at those emissions, that's 6% of the total emissions um, coming from um, uh, food loss and waste uh, from um, you know, human uh, um, induced emissions. If we ranked it, uh, against countries in terms of national emissions, it would just, it would come behind China and the US. So it would be, you know, a major emitter that would have to sit down at the table as like food waste sitting at the, the United Nations and go and having to justify why it was such a big emitter and what it was going to do about it. And it is really um, just such a, a, a key part, I think, of addressing the, the challenge of the food system and the environment is reducing food waste. Uh, in terms of the prime targets, I guess, across the food system for addressing climate change. So one of them at the top left is, is just getting it right in terms of our production. So like I talked about with things like uh, irrigation, um, precision agriculture, looking at understanding our soils and our crops and their requirements better. This is certainly a case for nitrogen fertilizer use there. We can reduce a lot of the inputs and make uh, production more efficient and cut um, the environmental impacts. Pete mentioned diet, so uh, there's lots of nice insects on sticks, um, but diet's a key part of that, particularly as we see overconsumption, like Pete mentioned, but also um, an increasingly affluent global population which moves more towards animal proteins as a trend, um, and they on average have higher carbon footprints. Uh, so looking at those diets and making sure that um, actually our policies link up with, um, with what messaging people are getting, what pricing they're getting in terms of food availability to enable people to make the choices which are good for planetary health, not just for human health, not just for the climate, but actually the planetary health um, kind of approach to diets. And then that third one, um, which is uh, some maize being eaten by bugs, uh, is that, that, uh, that kind of wastage aspect. So for most of us, it's going to be about looking at our what goes into the food bin each week, what's sitting at the back of your fridge right now and festering because it's gone past its uh, use by date. Um, but uh, across the world, it's a lot about looking at those um, that, that kind of food production, its vulnerability, particularly as climate change intensifies to reduce waste and loss in the fields. And then across the supply chain, how can we actually get that precious food and it is precious stuff to the people who need it um, uh, instead of it being lost as uh, food and waste. So I think just to summarize, yes, 
In terms of um, delivering, I guess, climate smart food in Scotland. Uh, so again, if you want to sleep um, well tonight, have a look at the, that, that um, Committee on Climate Change Net Zero report, and then open up a chapter on my climate smart food book and you will just go to sleep in an instant, I promise. Um, but delivering it in Scotland, we've got some real challenges. We've got Brexit um, at the end of this year in terms of a real uncertainty for farmers and a real risk in terms of uh, the standards for our food and what happens in terms of imports and exports. We've got that net zero imperative, uh, but a risk that people like me who are carbon geeks um, don't shed the carbon blinkers, that we look at land use and agriculture just from a point of view of we must increase carbon sequestration and we must cut emissions. And the truth is that our, uh, just as again Pete, Pete um, gave an overview to, our land gives us so much, we are part of it. Uh, it's not just about climate change, that's a key thing we need to deliver on, but also biodiversity, water quality, our community cohesion, so many things need to be balanced uh, in terms of what we're going to do over the, the coming decades. And part of that is the just transition. We've seen the inequalities across Scotland being stretched even further by COVID, rural communities being um, particularly badly hit in terms of the tourist in industry, for instance. And so uh, the future of land use and agriculture in Scotland needs to address those inequalities and actually move us towards a more equitable uh, society as well as a, a zero carbon one. So the final, I guess, flag I wanted to make was for the land use strategy. So this is being updated at the moment and will come out in spring next year, this update. Um, and I've got great hopes for it in terms of integrating agriculture with all of land use uh, in Scotland and giving us a way to, to deliver on those, like I say, those climate chart targets, but deliver us, I guess, a land use system, which is the envy of the world uh, and um, that really does show how you can make this work, feed people well in a sustainable way um, and keep our rural communities uh, thriving. Thank you. Fantastic, Dave. Um, wonderful presentation as always. It was uh, really interesting to hear about organic bananas from the Dominican Republic and fantastic to hear that that's something that has worked for them in terms of their own land use, but in, also in terms of their markets. Um, and it just shows the real bonus between having that intersection between uh, consumers and producers. Um, which will lead us quite nicely into our, our next um, presentation. But first, if we go back to Menti, so that's M-E-N-T-I dot com, and the number is 9017314, which is the same number as we were using before, we have a new question. What is the value of food wasted by the average household each year? So I have had some feedback that not everyone else can actually see um, the results. I'm going to share my screen um, and hopefully this is going to work. Um, can everyone see that? Yes, great. Okay, so we've got uh, about 10 people have replied. So the options were either £100 is wasted by the average household each year, £200 or £500. Um, <clears throat> And to be honest, it looks like um, this is a very food waste educated <laughs> audience um, because it is 500 pounds is, is the answer. And I mean, yes, that is the value to the consumer, but in terms of the price to land, to the environment, to the climate, that is huge. And especially with more and more people, um, you know, losing their jobs and not having enough money to, to buy food in general. Um, but it's also really worth stating that that food waste, an answer is not sending it to um, food banks, but that's another nourish policy, but it is all integrated. It's about actually stopping the food waste at source rather than diverting it. Great, okay, well, let's, um, let me stop sharing the screen. Um, and our next speaker is Sophie. And if I just bear with me for a minute, because I now can't find my, bits and pieces. Okay, Sophie um, joined Nourish this year. She works on projects on food systems governance and climate change with our international partners. Sophie's background is in international law with a special interest in the intersection of human rights and the environment. Prior to 
joining us at Nourish. She worked on facilitating participation of civil society in the process of incorporating international human rights in Scotland. Um, when she's not working very diligently, she's usually outside foraging, hill running or teaching rock climbing to young people. Right, Sophie, if you want to take over, that would be great. Thanks, Keisha. Thanks for the introduction. Um, and thanks to Pete and Dave for such brilliant presentations and for explaining so wonderfully just how important this connection between food systems and climate change is. Um, and especially, I'll just see if I can share my screen. Um, there we go. Can everyone see the screen okay? All good? Fantastic. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Dave, as well, for ending on the point about just transition, because I think that's really at the core of our projects for COP26, which is what I have the honor of introducing you all to. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll dive straight in and I'll talk about um, Nourish Scotland's plans for the COP26 in Glasgow next year. Um, we've got two interrelated projects. The first is the Glasgow Food and, sorry, I've just got myself over my screen. The first is the Glasgow Food and Climate Declaration, which is a declaration by local governments to tackle climate change through integrated food policies. The second is the Fort to Farm Dialogue, which is about amplifying farmers' voices in the climate change and food debate and bringing farmers and cities together in dialogue at COP26. And both of these pro uh, projects at their root are addressing the same core problem that both Pete and Dave were touching upon, which is that our food systems account for about a third of global uh, greenhouse gas emissions and contribute to environmental degradation, to biodiversity loss and to socioeconomic and health inequalities. And at the same time, the world's food systems um, are threatened by the climate and nature crisis um, with the effects that Dave explained so well before. So in other words, climate change are posing, is posing a significant threat to the right of everyone of current and future generations to have access to high quality food, but also food producers to have sustainable and secure livelihoods. At the same time though, as Dave said, um, food is also a comrade in the climate change debate. And so at the international science and policy communities and food systems, um, these transformative shifts are being planned and what is really important is that those are connected with the climate change debates. And that's really at the core of our project is to join those projects together and bring food systems to COP26. Secondly, at the core is to bring in the local actors who have a high stake in those debates, namely local authorities and farmers. Um, and there are two central reasons that underpin this. And that is on the one hand that some of the most progressive um, food system solutions to climate change happen at the local level. I think many of us have witnessed over the last six months in the pandemic just with the agility and creative solutions that have happened at the local sector among food producers, local authorities and communities. And that kind of creativity and innovation needs to take place in the climate change debates as well. And the second is this purpose of amplifying the voices that are usually marginalized in these spaces. And that is the voices in particularly of primary food producers, which is really essential to ensuring a just transition. So I'll go into, I'll dive into the Glasgow Food and Climate Declaration, which is a call to action for all levels of government to tackle climate change through integrated sustainable food policies. Um, so the Glasgow Declaration in its current form, which I'll go into more detail about in a minute, has been drafted um, in a process facilitated by Nora Scotland and the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems, IPAS Food, during the spring. We brought together international and regional food um, city networks, farmers organizations and NGOs and think tanks during a series of virtual meetings due to COVID-19 where we drafted this declaration. Um, we're planning to launch the declaration autumn at a one year to go event um, a year ahead of COP. Of course, the initial plan was to launch the declaration at COP. However, due to COVID, um, that has been postponed. And that has brought, in a way, some challenges about momentum, about our planning, but also great opportunities to build more of a social movement and to bring more local governments along. Um, and also to engage to other international forums, such as the UN Food Systems um, Summit, which will happen just before COP. The purpose of the declaration though is still to bring food systems and to bring the importance of local actors to COP26. It's a high level declaration, so it doesn't set out in detail what integrated food policies need to look like. It speaks a lot more to governance 
um, which if I return to the map that Pete illustrated before, is this bubble up here about how we govern our food systems. And it speaks really strongly to the point that Pete raised so well, that food is really undergoverned. Um, let me see. So um, the first two asks of the Glasgow Food and Climate Declaration is, is asks for local governments to develop integrated food policies and strategies in order to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from urban and regional food systems. To achieve that um, transition to sustainable and just food systems, however, we need to, as both Pete and Dave touched upon, align the actions across different sectors, um, as food is, is rarely governed in one place. Um, and the result is that in different ministries, such as agriculture, trade, and climate change, they are setting different agendas based on different priorities and conflicting objectives. And that leads to tension and obstructs um, progress. So for example, net zero emissions includes offsetting emissions through sustainable land use policies, but we'll have these different claims on land use for animal feed, for energy crops, for urban development, or for food production. And that's difficult to reconcile in the absence of overarching objectives and alignment for food systems. So what the Glasgow Declaration calls for is a holistic food systems approach that considers how all of these problems are interlinked and that in order for any climate change mitigation and adaptation policies and strategies that are associated with food to be to work all the impacts of the food systems need to be considered together um, the declaration is apologies one second I'm really sorry, I just had someone show up that I wasn't expecting. Um, where was I? Um, yeah, so the Glasgow Declaration calls for policies that join up all of these things. Um, the second call speaks really to national and international policy level, and that's about vertical integration um, and integrating policies at different levels in order to provide support and to mandate this great action at the local level. And one of the ways that the Glasgow Declaration calls for better integration of these levels of state, of city, of regional and of international governance is to ask national governments to include food systems in their nationally determined contributions, which refers to the pledges that countries make um, on their targets and contributions to meet the universal emission reductions under the Paris Agreement. And including food here would set a really high level priority that could mandate change at the local and national levels. Um, another way is by calling for these multi-level and multi-actor governance mechanisms. So that's about bringing these different levels of governance together to talk about, to set priorities together, um, but also about including more actors across the food system in governance to make sure that food policy works for everyone. And that brings us quite squarely to our second project, which is the Fork to Farm Dialogue. And in a nutshell, the Fork to Farm Dialogue is about bringing cities, by which we mean local governments, and farmers, by which we mean all types of primary food producers, together in dialogue at COP26. And that serves two main purposes. One is to create space for new partnerships between farmers and cities that can lead to creative and realistic food systems-based solutions to climate change. The second is to bring this voice, as I mentioned before, to marginalized actors who are often left out of these policies um, debates which are considered quite top-down, um, in particular that is farmers. So this is really about bringing farmers and farmers' voices to COP26 and to decision makers because that's really critical for a just transition. Um, so returning to our map here, I hope you can all see my cursor. Um, the Fork to Farm dialogues are really sitting down here and is about democratizing food system and climate change governance. Um, the fork to farm approach is, is quite deliberate. With this dialogue, we want to address the fact that, as, um, as Dave mentioned earlier, when, we look in, when we're looking at reducing the impact of food systems and climate change, focus is often placed on production where there's a lot to gain, but it needs to be integrated across all levels. Um, and what we need to bring in here is the, is the things that production systems are ultimately responding to, which is demand coming from cities and this top-down policy making. So in other words, what we eat in cities needs to be part of this conversation too, and dialogue is needed to make change at both of those ends of the food value chain um, align and breaking out of the silos that Dave mentioned before. 
Um, from a justice perspective, we also have to recognize that farmers face some of the most severe disruptions to their livelihoods and to their existence from both climate change itself, but also from many of the technologies and policies that are designed to, to tackle climate change. And these disruptions have only been exacerbated by COVID. So, um, so at the core of this, of this project for COP26, it's really that a just transition to sustainable food systems requires a dialogue between the local actors, but also to bring these local actors into the international policy space. Um, the dialogue process is all about creating a horizontal and inclusive space um, where people can speak freely, and in particular, where farmers can voice their perspectives very freely. Um, the dialogue that we envisioned initially was 100 city representatives and 100 farmers at COP26. Because of this new timeline due to COVID, um, we've actually quite excitingly been able to expand that and now we're now working with an international consortium of partners who represent farmers organizations and city networks on the ground to host um, a number of local dialogues across the world and they will include going into farming communities, speaking to people, finding out where their challenges and priorities are and bringing them together with the right decision makers um, in a space where we can start developing really good partnerships and come up with creative food systems based solutions to climate change in multi stakeholder meetings. We're also trying to capture some of these lessons of partnerships and collaboration and challenges and bringing those to COP at a final multi stakeholder international meeting there. So a lot of this is about energizing that community and bringing marginalized voices um, to the international climate change policy debates. Um, there's still quite a lot of open questions, not least due to COVID in terms of what kind of meeting will, we might be able to have a COP and to what extent we'll be able to influence um, international processes. Um, but the important thing here is to that these small voice, small voices are not excluded um, from that space. And so on that note, thanks so much, everyone. Um, you can join me and Kat from SCCS in the Food and COP breakout room if you want to learn more. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, that was um, fascinating. Um, to well, I do know what we're doing. Luckily, but I hope other people have really um, enjoyed learning more about what our ambitions are for for COP. And I hope um, it's also a bit of um, a way to show that it doesn't matter really how small you are as an organisation or as an individual. You can be part of this very big conversation, either. Um, by doing your own stuff or getting involved in, in things that other people are doing. So um, if we go back to Menti, um, I'm going to be asking the question whether or not you disagree or agree with what we at Nourish are trying to do. And I'm, I'm not trying to say that what we're doing is definitely the right thing. This is just what we are. This is what our ambition is. So food should be central to the conversations at COP. Yes or no. Farmers should have more of a voice at COP. Yes or no and non-state actors like cities should have more of a role at COP and I'm going to try and share my screen so that everybody can um, see what people's various responses are. Right. So it's quite interesting that actually there's um, some people don't, it's not quite sharing yet but hopefully it will. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay, well, um, so that farm, some people are not quite, everyone's agreeing about farmers having more of a voice at COP or non-state actors like cities. Um, but yeah, um, that's interesting to have a feedback, but I suppose four out of, four out of five isn't bad. <laughs> right, okay, so um, our final bit of today is um, an opportunity for us to have more of an um, interaction and um, get you all off mute. Um, so I'm hoping that everyone has chosen which breakout room they wanted to go to and put that in either in the chat box or change their name. Um, and I think Tammy, if you haven't, please do so now. Probably in the chat box is the easiest. And Tammy and Kat are going to be able to um, break us out in that magical way that breakout rooms on Zoom work. Very good. And then we'll join back here at about 12.25, a couple more questions and um, finish up.